The next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Jürgen Trabant, who is a distinguished linguist from Freie Universität Berlin and also a member of our academy. Uh, he will speak on academies and the defense of European national languages. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me. And, uh, and yes, uh, um, Jürgen Ostermann just said, being a member of the academy is a gift. Uh, and a gift which uh, implies that you have to work, and hence uh, I'm now uh, trying to work. And uh, posso fare una prima uh, osservazione preliminare, perché questo è quello che faccio, è una, è una certa contraddizione performativa, perché parlo in inglese. Allora parlerò in inglese. Preliminary, pre preliminary remark. Speaking of the defense of uh, national languages, uh, automatically, evokes the mother of all language defenses, that is, uh, Joachim du Bellay's Défense et Illustration de la Langue Française, 1549. It is a defense of the French language against Latin, the universal language of the Middle Ages, and its aim is to make French as illustrious as Latin, Illustration. I will not say more about that book, but I want you to keep that book in mind and the title in mind. My talk has three parts, language academies, um, yes, academies of science and the Leibnizian uh, science uh, academy. Language academies, language academies. Thus, the, my, uh, the, the, the talk of language academies is of course to defend and to promote national languages. Thus, to mention just the two most famous language academies, the Kruska and the French Academy, the Académie Française explicitly and passionately defends French against all possible aggressors, hence also against the most aggressive aggressor today, that is uh, the one that takes its place in many communication situations against English or globalese, as I call it. The Academia della Crusca bravely defends Italian. In the conflict about the introduction of English as the only teaching language in the Politecnico di Milano, the Crusca fought for the maintenance of Italian in the university. Claudio Marazzini, its president, against, uh, protested against the indebito quanto insensato tentativo di imposizione totale, autoritaria e forzata della lingua inglese con esplicita e autolesionistica abolizione dell'italiano. The Deutsche Akademie für Sprache und Dichtung would never do such a thing. I am not aware of any protest of that academy against the decision of the Technical University of Munich to do just the same as the Milanese Polytechnico, that is to establish an exclusively English uh, teaching or against the recent announcement of the Bavarian government to impose English in all technical universities as the uh, only language. And there are no German professors, and there will be no German professors, suing the Munich TU uh, or applying uh, to the Constitutional Court as did the, their Italian colleagues. Nobody dares. Protesters against the imposizione totale, autoritaria e forzata of English would be crucified as awful nationalists or worse. The bad N-word is always present in as the ultimate weapon in any or nearly any political question in Germany. Hence, no defense of German in German academia or in the Deutsche Akademie für Sprache und Dichtung. But normally, language academies defend their languages. This has to be specified a little bit historically. The Kruska and the Académie Française were founded to make order in a somewhat chaotic linguistic situation. The Kruska to codify a literary norm, a literary norm for Italy, and the French Academy to create a linguistic norm for the social elite of the centralized kingdom. Donner des règles certaines à notre langue et la rendre pure, éloquente et capable de traiter les arts et les sciences. This is the uh, um, paragraph 40, uh, 24, I think, of the Règlement 
de la Académie française. These tasks necessarily imply a defense of the languages they create and protect, not necessarily uh, against foreign languages, by the way, but against unwelcome linguistic forms that contradict the finality of their codification. Thus, the Crusca defended its Tuscan Italian against words from other dialects and from lower or spoken language. The French Academy defended its aristocratic Parisian language against low and provincial uh, language. So, thus, so the adversary against which the languages are defended changes in the course of history. Thus, the French Academy, after the revolution, fought against aristocratic distinction and old royalistic thinking in the words. Hence, it fought in a certain way against itself. And it fought for a republican or democratic language. It did not really succeed, by the way, but uh, nevertheless, the language it defended after the revolution was considered as the language of the nation that had become the sovereign in the republic, hence a national language. Now, language academies today in democracies in the globalized world therefore defend their national languages against the linguistic dangers of that world. And the main danger being, of course, the invasive power of English and the disappearance of the national language, the disappearance of the national languages in certain important domains of communication. As you <laughs> Thus, once more, the Kruska defended Italian against the takeover of English at the Politecnico, against, once more, the authoritarian, the compulsory total imposition of the English language with the explicit and self-destructive abolition of Italian, as Claudio Marazzini put it. The Kruska thereby pointed to the fact that, in fact, one of the most important and prestigious fields of discourse that the national languages are losing is the field of science. And the field, the language of science was already, I'm speaking in Italian, one of the problems raised by the so-called questione della lingua nel Cinquecento. The question then was whether science should write uh, and speak the vulgar language, the language of the people, volgo, volgare, or stay with uh, Latin the learned language of medieval Europe, the globalese of the old world. And the most advanced and modern position, the position of the natural scientist, was then to switch uh, from Latin, to, or from Latin globalese, to vulgare. This is what Galilei did, the scientist of all scientists, when he passed from Latin to Italian, Tuscan, in his most influential writings in the Saggiatore, and in the discourse. And this is what Bacon did in England, Francis Bacon, the father of the European Enlightenment. And then Descartes, Nico, Kant, they all switched to their vulgar languages. But in, in the wake of the Italian discussion, now the French Academy took a strong and modern stance in the question of the language of science. It, its second task, as we saw, was to make the French language capable de traiter les arts et les sciences. And therefore, the French Academy uh, elaborated French for being used in the sciences. And therefore, the French Academy did not only write a dictionary for, of common usage, uh, the uh, Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française, but the French Academy published also a Dictionnaire des Arts et des Sciences. This one, same year, by the way. And this uh, second dictionary is an explicit inclusion or integration of science into the French language, that is, into a vulgar language, and, of course, the other way around, the integration of French into science. And from that historical book on, we might say the sciences in Europe belonged, uh, so to say, officially to the vulgar languages. Second point. Academies of Sciences. Now, in the same period, the Academies of Sciences were founded. <laughs> they are nearly all already mentioned. Here we are, have the list, the Academia de Luchet, the Royal Society, Academy des Sciences, uh, the Prussian Academy, and the Academy des Inscriptions. 
the academies of science have to foster and to fend scientific excellence and the best conditions for scientific production, défense et illustration of science, if you want. There is, at first sight, no concern with language. Thus, for instance, the Royal Society, just mentioned, describes its mission today, uh, the Society's fundamental purpose, reflected in its founding charters of the 1660s, is to recognize, promote, and support excellence in science and to encourage the development and use of science for the benefit of humanity. And the Académie des Sciences uh, describes its fundamental uh, mission in the following way, encourager la vie scientifique, la production de connaissances motivées par la perspective d'application ou par la seule envie de savoir est vital pour le dynamisme économique et culturel d'une nation. Now, as places for these encouragement uh, of science, the academies are institutions in which, as the philosopher Jürgen Mittelstrass put it, science should or reflect upon themselves in order to create these good conditions for scientific excellence. Uh, Mittelstrass writes, in the academy, science reflects upon itself, and in the academy, society reflects upon its scientific nature. Science recognizes itself, and society recognizes its future that is not possible without science. Now, in that self-reflection, uh, 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 the academies will easily come to the point that science is also a linguistic process. Science speaks, science writes at different points of its production for different people, for different purposes, in different depths. Science is a complicated ensemble of language games, and therefore science and its institutions, the academies, certainly have to give some thought on the question of language in the scientific process, even if they don't say something about it in their official declarations. But this is what science did from its very first academy on, I mean, from Plato's uh, grove of Academos. Plato asked, what is the role of language in the search for true knowledge? Do we find any knowledge in words? And this was Plato's question in his dialogue about language in the Cratylus. And his answer was, and this is very important, since words are bad images of the world, it would be better to do without and thrive for true knowledge without language. Anyhow, this is what Socrates said, said at the end of the Cratylus. And hence, from its very first moment, science is opposed, opposed to language. Plato did not say whether uh, having knowledge without language is possible or not. He, of course, he always leaves the questions open. But here comes Aristotle, and normally, as normally he does, resolved Plato's language problem for European scientists for thousands of years. Language, according to the Interpretazione, has no, has no cognitive impact. It is only a means of communication. Words are only signs, semeia. Language is only sound, ta interfone. Different languages, different languages are different sound. Thought, he says, is universally the same for everybody. Hence, language does not matter for cognition. What language we use is only a question of practical communication. And this, unfortunately, is still the majoritarian, majoritarian position, not only in science, it is the trivial common opinion about language. And this is why the Politecnico, or the TU Munich, or the Bavarian government just want to switch to English without any further if reflection. Languages are just trivial means of communication. However, uh, Aristotle is not always right. 2,000 years after Aristotle, mainly after the encounter with the American nations and their rather uh, radically different languages, the Europeans had to realize that languages are not only different sound, 
but that they contain also different thought, that they conceptualize the world in different ways. Language is production of thought and not only communication. And thought is different in different languages. This insight, this dramatic insight, renders scientists still more furious against language because it jeopardizes the existence of universal thought. Hence, they must do something about it. They must re-establish a universal scientific language. The new Aristotle, Bacon, uh, connects the installation of the modern sciences uh, with a passionate criticism of natural language, with its faults and unscientific concepts, with the idola for the idols of the market, which are the worst of all idols of all prejudices. And he imagines a kingdom of science, regnum scientiarium, with a new scientific language in the scientific paradise. After, um, after uh, Bacon, Locke then continues the same idea and laments about the mist, a word cast before our eyes. The, the words obscurity and disorder does not send them cast a mist before our eyes and impose upon our understandings. However, what happens in real life, and Bacon is one of the protagonists of that historical process, is that science, modern science, Baconian science, just goes over to the vulgar languages, notwithstand, notwithstanding the terrible semantic dangers connected to them. Modern science speaks in vulgar languages and not in a new celestial paradise, paradise language. Modern sciences do so for political reasons. Their domain of action is the closer political or linguistic community. This is very clear in Galileo, for instance. France, England, Italy, not the old Latin world, the Catholic uh, European world uh, anymore. Thus, the academies here on my list, uh, these uh, use their vulgar uh, or national languages as their names indicate. Of course, they still use a little bit of Latin, but mainly the, the, the main languages used are uh, the languages of, uh, uh, of the country. The Académie des Sciences just uses French. It does not reflect upon the language of science. Neither does the Académie des Inscriptions, the Academy for the Humanistic Sciences. They are not concerned with language. This task, of course, in France is left to the Académie Française, the French language uh, uh, society, uh, academy. And, but this French separation of the scientific academies from the language academy perpetuates the Aristotelian separation of thought and language and language as communication. The scientific academies keep away from the language question. My third point, the Leibnizian Academy. There is, however, the interesting exception of my own uh, academy, not only this one, but only the, the Prussian one, the Kurfürstlich Brandenburgische Societät der Wissenschaften. The Prussian Academy did not follow the French example of separating the natural sciences from the humanities, and it did not separate the two scientific academies from the language academy. It connected both provinces of science with the language problem. As you can see, from the frontispiece of the first whoops, of the first publication no, of the first publication, where is my pointer? Mm -hmm. oh, here it is. Excuse me. As you can see from that image, we on the one side we have the humanities, here is the humanities is a book, and on the other side we have the natural uh, sciences. Um, uh, on the left side, hence the allegoric representation of the humanistic disciplines, and the right-hand side, the natural sciences, medicine, physics, mathematics. Science is conceived of, we have it already today, in the Latin and the German meaning of the word as applying to both realms of the learned elaboration of the world. And in the middle, we have a book whose title shows four letters. T TWSS, it's not very, very well, it's, it's also representing those Baroque letters, TW and SS, 
And these letters are the abbreviation for this, for Deutscher Wort- und Sprachschatz, German word and language treasure. The sciences and the humanities shall develop a linguistic treasure for the national language, Deutsch, and vice versa. The language treasure also feeds the sciences. Thus, on the one side, the sciences are responsible for the enrichment of the national language, for its defense, and on the other side, also the national language is the home of the sciences. Thus, the frontispiece symbolizes the um, connection of the sciences and the national language. And this connection is based on philosophical reason. Following Bacon's and Locke's insights that languages have cognitive importance, Leibniz was deeply convinced of the connection of thought and language. The British philosophers had discovered the cognitive, the cognitive impact of languages, but for them it was a catastrophic insight. They lamented over the cognitive obscurity and diversity of natural languages, a mist before our eyes, and wanted to get rid of that mist, of course. Leibniz just turned this lamentation into a celebration, into a celebration of languages. Yes, he said, uh, against Locke, huh? languages contain thought, but this, but, but, but this uh, and it's not, it's not only a mist before our eyes, but this thought is precious. It's connaissance, as he said in, uh, in the um, essay, in the, in the nouveau essay. On enregistrera, uh, en, uh, enregistrera avec le temps et mettra en dictionnaire et en grammaire toutes les langues de l'univers, because they are Uh, les langues sont les plus anciens monuments du genre humain, et on les comparera entre elles, ce qui aura des usages très grands, tant pour la connaissance des choses que pour la connaissance de notre esprit et de la merveilleuse variété de ses opérations. Thus, the different languages contain knowledge of the world, chose, and of the mind, connaissance de notre esprit, and therefore languages have to be documented as precious knowledge and they contribute to our knowledge of the world, and they have to be elaborated and developed through the sciences. And the sciences contribute on their side to the cognitive treasure, to the Sprachschatz of the national language. For Leibniz, now oh, this is in English, then. for Leibniz, the uh, knowledge in the natural languages is not, is not yet the highest uh, knowledge, kind of knowledge, Languages is, a language is only a cognitio disti clara, distincta, inadequata. Perhaps even only cognitio clara, confusa. I'm not quite sure about uh, how to interpret the passage uh, in, the, in, the, in the Cognizione uh, de Veritate et Ideis in Leibniz. So anyhow, it's not, it's not the highest. It's not the scientific uh, knowledge. Scientific uh, knowledge is clara, distincta, adequata. Hmm? But, um, um, so... Uh, Uh, scientific knowledge transcends the knowledge sedimented in languages, but in order to get there, we have to use the treasures of the natural languages. They are the basis of the highest uh, of scientific knowledge. And Leibniz's hierarchy of knowledge makes it possible, I think, to understand the language uh, question in science. Hence, yes, academies, scientific academies, academies have the duty to reflect on their linguistic nature because thought is inextricably, inextricably immersed in language. And this is, according to, to me and uh, according to the proposition of Jürgen Mittelstadt, this is an element of their self-reflection, an element of the reflection on the conditions of the possibility of scientific production and scientific excellence. And in that reflection of the conditions of scientific excellence, they should take also into account one final observation. In the Prussian Academy, as well as in the Lycee or in the Academy of Torino, humanistic and natural sciences together form one body of knowledge. In Latin, as well as in German, all disciplines, I have said already, are sciences, Wissenschaften. And through this togetherness, the academies become aware of the fact that the language question is not the same for the whole scientific family. 
if I may simplify, the experiential nature of the natural sciences imply, uh, implies material, material instruments as essential means of the scientific process. Language is here not so much an instrument of research, but rather only a means of communication of it, its results. And this, I think, uh, you have to interpret Aristotle in this way. So he's talking about, uh, about scientific uh, um, results. And these results are often symbolized with non-linguistic meanings, with signs or images. But this, of course, is different for the humanistic sciences. Their means of exploration, their means, uh, main research instrument is language. Their research result is not an image, a schema, or numbers. Well, the next slide. Uh, their result is a text, language. The instrument, as well as the result, and often also the object, of that research is linguistic. And just as the natural scientists need the best instrument, also the humanists need the best instruments. And the best instruments are the languages, the languages they know and manipulate best. And therefore, they have a much closer relation to the national and vulgar language they use. They therefore tend to cling to the national languages as a condition of the possibility of their excellence. And in the case of the academies like the Lincei, Turin, or Berlin, they have to defend these means for the production of excellent research in the humanistic sciences, and they have to defend the defense et illustration des langues européennes. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Trabant, for your nice talk. And uh, there are questions, Professor Settis, <coughs> and then Professor Mori. It's more a comment than a question. I, I very much enjoyed your talk, and I wanted to mention what might be a case in point in relation to the archaeological, to my field, the ar archaeological, uh, what is now the German Archaeological Institute, uh, um, Deutsches Archaeologisches Institut, was actually founded as an international, more, it was more closer to an academy than to a, a, a research institute in Rome in 1828, mostly by Germans. And in the uh, Annali dell'Instituto, and Bulletino dell'Istituto di Corrispondenza Archeologica, only three languages were allowed, namely Latin, Italian, French. No German. No German. This situation stayed the same until 1870. After the German Empire, everything changed and uh, French was basically uh, cancelled. Uh, as, uh, uh, as much as Latin and Italian and, 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 and German are still today, the two, and now also English, the, 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 the main language is used in the Mitteilung at the Deutsches Archaeologisches Institutes in Rome. So if you, if you want to comment on this. But this is, uh, this, is, this is good news since you have still three languages and not only one, English. Normally uh, German uh, journals today switch to English, like, for instance, one of the most... Uh, a clamorous uh, uh, change, uh, change, changes of language was uh, the, the Japanese uh, uh, journal for, for, for Japanese German studies. And it was, a, it was a journal that was published in German, in Japan. Uh, and then uh, the, the new director came and said, well, there's no need for any German uh, scholarship on Japan anymore so we, uh, in German, so we publish it in English. And, and, and of course, this is this is what what the Germans do, and and, and we also like very much to to uh, entertain ourselves in in learned uh, discussions uh, in in English, even if there is no American or English speaking persons amongst us. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Jürgen, for um, <laughs> for. <laughs> Uh, for your uh, fascinating talk. Uh, on one side, 
you have defended uh, national languages and uh, the strict the relationship between national relationship and their contents, hmm? also their scientific contents. On the other, on the other side, on the other hand, you have permitted, uh, the, the, you have acknowledged that English as lingua franca is the knowledge of communication. Hmm? You yourself have uh, spoken in English. Uh, question, what is the border? What is the border, the border line between the two areas? Uh, I, expl I explain myself with, a, with an example. Uh, a scholar in the humanities writes a paper on a subject and he will, of course, that this paper uh, will, uh, uh, will be read as widespread as possible. What, what, is, what uh, shall he choose? The power of language or the power of communication? Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> Of course, I know. I know. I have to, to tell my young colleagues uh, write it in English because otherwise you will not be re read uh, beyond Flensburg and Salzburg. Uh, but now you will be read in Honolulu and Poughkeepsie also, and uh, <laughs> and this of course is a wonderful thing. Uh, no, but yeah, but we are glad that we have English and that we can do what we do here, and that, that I can be sure that that even the colleagues from Finland or or Spain and so will understand what I'm what I'm saying. So this is clear. It's, it's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful instrument for, for communication. But what I'm saying is that that um, yes, that as a, as a working instrument, we should also uh, consider our languages as the best instrument, and and we should also consider so uh, also that let's say the, the space between Flensburg and Salzburg. Is not so bad. I mean, this 100 million readers or possible readers. Uh, of course, it's not uh, two two billions, uh, but it's a, it's a nice group still reading uh, papers in German. So, so I don't see uh, the, the the problem. Uh, no. I, I of course all this. Anybody tells us, yeah, but the Danish colleague is writing in English. Uh, why why do, do you not? They say the Danish, of course, is a very small, small, very small linguistic community, and however. The most important book written in my field uh, was written in Danish by Louis Jemsler uh, in the last century, on things called Theory and Grundlages. This was uh, the, uh, translated into English as Prolegomena to a Theory of Language, but it's one of the stellar books uh, on linguistics written in Danish in Denmark in the, in the, in the 40s. So, um, and, and I think he no, James, when he wrote internationally, he wrote French, not, not, not so much. He wrote also in English. But this book, he wanted to write it in Danish because it's his very, I think it's his heart. And it's his, his really nuclear book and thought. And hence he wrote it in Danish. So, and, and, and as, as, uh, as, um, as uh, Galilei uh, said, yeah, I have no time to write it in, in Latin. Uh, please translate it into, into Latin. So I, I have to write it in Tuscan, but if you want to read it, oltre, oltre, <laughs> oltre le, le montagne, allora uh, tra, uh, uh, traducetelo in, in latino se volete. But, but you're right, I mean, the problem is uh, uh, my, myself as an example. I wrote books and articles, hundreds of articles, but they're all for the, for the, uh, for the, for the, for the abyss of the, for the destruction. So I will be in existence after, <laughs> after my, my death because ev nearly everything is written in German and hence nobody will read that anymore. So, but yeah, tragedy is also a solution. I would like just uh, to say two words because we had a very long discussion in Politecnico di Torino about whether we should or not shift to English, but only in some courses. Yeah. And at the end, for example, 
in automotive engineering will shift it completely to English because uh, not so much for this theoretical discussion about science uh, or how to make science, but how to communicate science to students. And the point was that uh, we have in automotive engineering about 40% of students who don't speak Italian because they are foreigners. Mm. And uh, so we had uh, some professor who didn't want that. I had a lot of opposition because at that time I took the decision. And uh, we had a lot of opposition of people saying we teach in a bad English and so students don't understand. But at the end, the idea was that in a global world, these students, half are foreigners. The other half, who are Italian, when they go to work and they make meetings in multinational industries, right. they make meetings in English. Mm -hmm. And so they had to learn and to use English. But we had that problem and we discussed yeah. it for almost one year <laughs> and at the end. But fortunately, we didn't have uh, on ourselves uh, the reprimenda of uh, the Academia della Crusca. Yeah. They didn't say anything didn't to say us. Anything. <laughs> yeah, but Marazzini did. <laughs> thank, thank you for, for, for your contribution. I think, of course, this is, this is the situation you're describing. However, I think what the Corte Costituzionale decided is a very wise thing. Because they decide, because the Politecnico, the, the Politecnico di Milano wanted an exclusively English uh, uh, teacher. Yes. And, and the Corte Constitutional said, no, there are two reasons why there will not be, an, shouldn't be an exclusive. You can teach in English if you want to, but you have to do also a, a, a teaching in Italian because not for the social reason, not uh, every Italian boy is as rich as to go to America for the year and to learn English. Uh, so uh, there is a social reason and uh, the other reason, second reason, is because uh, science is a part of the Italian culture and that Italian culture expresses itself uh, in Italian. Hence, uh, there is also a cultural reason. I think that was a, that was a very wise, uh, wise uh, decision. And th this is what I would have liked also for Germany, but now I'm waiting whether some Bavarian professor will do the same thing to, to, to the Bavarian government or the, to the technical university. But I think nobody, really nobody does. Nobody does. There, there will be no professor at Munich who say, oh, I, I, I'm against this because this is anti-modern, this is nationalistic, this is provincial, and so, and hence there will be no constitutional uh, verdict on, on, on the question in Germany. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Professor Loprieno. Uh, uh, Trabant, we, we had a kind of uh, beginning of this discussion in Vienna, you remember it, so I'm going to bring now the argument again, which is perhaps what we might call a sociolinguistic argument. And that is that our situation right now in terms of defending or using European languages might not be comparable with what uh, we had in early modern uh, times or even until the 19th century because uh, the, of the presence of a lingua franca. Now one could say in the question de la langue, one also had a lingua franca. However, there's a certain difference between a purely uh, written lingua franca and a very productive one like mm -hmm. the one we have now. And in, in situation of lingua franca, usually the oppositions that emerge are not so much between collateral languages, English, Italian, French, German, but rather between the lingua franca and another, let's call it dialect in the etymological sense that is used at the personal or cultural level. I can bring the example, for example, of Swiss universities where uh, Swiss German University, where until 20 years ago, the only real language was German. And now I would say German is the most threatened, standard German is the most threatened language mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. Swiss universities yeah. because the real alternative is between English and Swiss German. So if I speak to a student, I obviously speak in Swiss German. Yeah. 
uh, or if he is a foreigner, I speak in English. Uh, so, and this is a typical situation of lingua franca, which was not the situation of parallel national languages. Yes, um, I agree, but I, I oppose to the usage of the term lingua franca, because the lingua franca you were using when you were using the so-called, you know, when you were using standard German, yes. was not a lingua franca. And I'm, I really oppose all I, I say, no, lingua, what was a lingua franca? A lingua franca was, a, was a, a, an ensemble of words used in the ports, in the ports of the Mediterranean. It was just um, uh, without any syntax and so, just words, uh, Turkish and uh, Italian and French and so. Very, it's what we use at, at airports. Huh? One package of uh, Marlboro, please, and, and, uh, and that's it. And, but, but the language we use in science and uh, uh, the English we use in science is not a lingua franca. It's a, it's a, it's a fully fledged, uh, very complicated uh, dialect, if you want to. It's uh, as was German for the for the Swiss, for the Swiss, and hence and hence the situation uh, is 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 in more compatible to Latin because Latin was also not only written; it was spoken all over all over Europe uh, with different dialects and so on. It was also for for the erudites; it was an, an elaborate language. It was not not a lingua franca. It was a, a, a fully fledged language. And and uh, but, but but the but this is also the problem. How much English do we have to know? And and I think for w once more uh, um, <laughs> facilitating the the, the 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 image a little bit. So I think um, speaking about a, a specific field of chemistry in English is really uh, more uh, is easier than uh, making an interpretation of a novel of Balzac in English or, or speaking about the, uh, about the Goethe uh, novel in English because then you have to be as good as the Eng English native speaker. Hence, no lingua franca. This is, has really to be a quasi-native uh, language we have to have. And this is, of course, uh, as I said, the, <laughs> the constitutional court, this is, of course, a, a very difficult task to, 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 to get to that kind of knowledge of, a, of the other language, which is not only uh, a lingua franca. <laughs> I'm insisting with this, this is absolutely a little bit stupid also because everybody now uses the term lingua franca in the, in the, in the way we used it. I, I opposed it because it's, it's not a simple lingua franca. It's a, it's a real language, a complicated uh, syst linguistic system and specialized and, and and, and also we have to, in order to be a real good scientist in English, you have to, read, you have to talk it, you have to write it perfectly, you have even to be witty in a certain way. So this, I taught, as you, as you know, I taught for, for, for eight years in, in, in English, in an, Anglo, in an English-speaking university. And, and uh, yeah, but I'm... Funny remarks uh, would not come easily from, from my mouth, uh, so I, 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 stuck, I was stuck with my, with my German uh, English, uh, uh, yes. And, uh, and, and hence, to be a, a really good scientist, you have to own, uh, you have to master the English mastery. And, and this is also another problem. Other questions? If not, uh, thank you once more. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.